we have seen it all in terms of formula. And I will now show many examples. It will be a little bit redundant, perhaps, but I want to make sure everybody understands. Uh, my first example of where one could do PCA would be uh, to reduce the dimensionality of patterns like this. So here you see a few hundred uh, of digits. Uh, They're supposed to be a six by different writers. This is called, uh, this, this is, uh, the data set is called the MNIST data set. And uh, in uh, the earlier days of pattern recognition, that was an important benchmark. And now people have completely overfitted to this. So uh, maybe the very recent papers are not so interesting, but, but the older ones are nice because they, they give you a benchmark on this uh, simple problem. So uh, each of these digits has been uh, sampled at a resolution of around uh, 30 by 30 pixels. So uh, each digit is, uh, can be represented as a vector with uh, around 900 entries. Okay, so we vectorize each of these patches. We, so each patch is a matrix, but we turn it into a vector. And then we can, uh, so then we have points that live in this around 900 dimensional space. And we're now looking for a low dimensional representation. And I've taken uh, uh, not only the sixes, but also uh, uh, zero, one, two, three, four, fives, and so on. And uh, just plotted the result on the first two principal components. And uh, well, I, I get this image. So, so I've indicated, uh, so what, what's shown here are the scores, so the, uh, the coordinates in my new principal components basis of uh, each of these examples. Uh, I've only taken uh, maybe 20 or so, uh, I forget how many examples from each of the digit classes here. And since this is unsupervised learning, the labels were not used in finding the principal components. So they were simply used as image patches. But afterwards, I have plotted the class, uh, you know, for us to have a look if, uh, if the principal components in this case make sense or not. And, uh, well, we see two things. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it's certainly uh, this 2D representation is not good enough to get a nice, crisp, uh, clustering of all the different classes. But on the other hand, we do see some general trends, you know, with the zeros being over there and uh, the sixes uh, in that corner and so on. So, you know, if you have 900 dimensional data and, uh, well, we are, you know, us humans, we're very good at looking at 900 dimensional data, which looks like this, but there's 900 dimensional data that is much harder for us to plot in terms of an image patch. And in such cases, uh, you know, users are quite grateful if they can get an overview plot like that. So again, terminology, uh, these are the scores. Those are the coordinates in the new basis. And the new basis being orthogonal uh, can be seen as a rotation away from the old basis. For the same example, I've shown the eigenvalues. And uh, the eigenvalue tells you how much, the eigenvalue associated with each principal component tells you how big the spread is along that dimension. And this is a very typical behavior. So, you know, seeing some kind of exponential decay, uh, users look for jumps or shoulders. So, for instance, uh, the, the first principal component seems very meaningful. The second and third are quite similar in importance, but then there seems to be a jump between the third and the fourth. So it would have made sense to produce a 3D plot of those numbers so that we would be able to rotate them. And the eigenvectors, they tell you, uh, well, how much information is contained in only the first, in the first and the second, the first, second, third, and so on. So on the right-hand side, it's difficult to see for you, but I've here made a cumulative plot. So I've added up all those eigenvalues. And if we include all eigenvalues, then we will get the original data just in a different, in a rotated basis. So then we're somewhere up here. Uh, 
but uh, you can now choose any approximation you like. You can say, okay, I'm happy to <coughs> keep just 90% of my variance, and if I want to keep 90% of my variance, I would need of the order of 100 dimensions here. Uh, this is, as you see, it's called a scree plot of uh, the eigenvalues. Uh, here you see on the top the eigenvalues or the eigenvectors, the principal components, uh, represented in the original basis. So uh, this would be uh, the mean, the mean vector that I had to subtract from the data before doing anything. So if you superimpose the ones and the twos and the threes and so on, uh, you will get this thing here that tells you on average what, uh, what does a digit look like. And then this is the first principal component, the second principal component, the third principal component shown as an image. So because our raw data lives in a 900 dimensional space, the first principal component, which is an axis in this 900 dimensional space, well, also has 900 dimensions. So I can again represent it uh, in the unvectorized form as a small image patch here. Well, and uh, you see that the principal components have positive and negative entries. That is natural because the only orthogonal basis which has all positive entries is the Cartesian coordinate system. And as soon as you start rotating the system, <coughs> you will get at least uh, some principal components that will have negative entries. Uh, most of them will have both positive and negative entries. <coughs> well, there can be just one which is all positive. That's the one pointing in the first authent, and all others must have negative entries. And typically, uh, all have negative entries. So negative entry means, you see, zero is this medium gray value, and uh, positive or negative is then white or black. Okay, so we have here the, the different uh, principal components, and it's a little bit hard to attach uh, a meaning to them. You can perhaps hallucinate, uh, you know, seeing a digit here or there, but uh, uh, a, a characteristic of principal components, because they're orthogonal, is that you tend to see the same structure in, in several of these. And then I have uh, taken a couple of examples here. So that's a single digit one. And I have now shown its uh, approximation by using more and more of the principal components. So to represent this digit, I need 900 numbers. If it's a 30 by 30 patch, I would need 900 numbers uh, to give all these gray values. Here is now an approximation in terms of just a single number. So if, you, uh, if we go back to this plot, this would be my first principal component. And I can now represent every possible observation just in terms of this first principal component. And well, all these numbers, when projected onto the first principal component, look pretty much the same. All these observations look the same. But now we start adding in a second principal component, and we start to see already small differences. Okay, now the one does look a little bit different from the two, and so on. And then we add a third principal component, and a fourth, and a fifth, and you see that the approximation becomes better and better. So on the right-hand side, you see each of these specific digits represented by 20 numbers, namely the 20 scores <coughs> in the 21st principal components. So you can think of this as compression. Uh, 900 bytes here, uh, 20 bytes there. And you also see that it works better for some examples than for others. So this four, for instance, still looks very poor after representing it in terms of principal, 20 principal components. It apparently lies you know, out of this uh, subspace that we have just matched. So again, this was the cumulative sum. And perhaps uh, to get this four nicely, I would, I, maybe I would have needed 100 dimensions, not just 20. OK. So there's uh, 
the MNIST example. Uh, I have uh, screenshots from the original, I think it's the original paper uh, on eigenfaces. Uh, I, I told you that uh, principal component is important, so it has been reinvented many times, uh, not least by people working in image processing, and uh, they weren't happy with the name eigenvectors, so they've called it eigenfaces. And then there have been many subsequent papers, uh, eigen this, eigen that. Uh, we have contributed to that, I'm afraid. Um, so the, uh, you see, it's pretty much the same thing as on the as on the previous slide. On the left hand side are the eigenvectors, or here after unvectorizing, they're shown as patches. You see the basis functions that span this. Uh, space of all faces, and on the right-hand side, you see an approximation of a particular person using more and more basis functions. Um, and, well, these basis functions, it's not like we have basis functions for the eyebrows and eye basis functions for the mouth and for the cheeks and so on, but uh, somehow uh, the entire face is visible in every basis function. However, you can still interpret them to some extent. So, for example, the first basis function, you know, black here and white there, as you move along that uh, coordinate, uh, you can differentiate between uh, people who have uh, bright hair and uh, dark face, or if you go in the other direction, uh, people with a bright face, uh, with a dark face and bright hair. Huh? Then this component here, accounts mainly for shift. You see the, the biggest parts, or the, the, the strongest coefficient of this component are here and there. So if somebody, uh, when he had this picture taken, moved up a little bit or moved uh, away from that side, uh, that would explain for this component here. Then, uh, you know, th this one is also, this one accounts for shift. You see we have a positive here and negative there. Uh, so that is for uh, left-right shift. And then sometimes you have components that you can identify as accounting for glasses or accounting for strong eyebrows uh, and so on. And generally, as you go to higher dimensions, these components become noisier and uh, harder to interpret. So. Well, people in those days used it to improve uh, classification results, but you can also use it for compression. So instead of uh, using, this is much more than 30 by 30 pixels, uh, perhaps this is 50 by 50. So instead of using 2,500 components, you can use just 50 or so to explain uh, a face. Um, two comments on this. The sign of the eigenvectors is arbitrary. So uh, if this is black and that is white or vice versa, makes no difference to the formula that you've seen. So it's only defined uh, up to a sign. <coughs> I have uh, an example here that you will see in your exercises or in the bonus part of the exercises. Um, this is uh, raw data from a satellite group in Heidelberg and Mainz. On the left-hand side, you see an estimated uh, uh, nitric oxide concentration map as acquired by the satellite. And as we move over time, you see the seasonal changes. So uh, around half a year is over now and around one year is over now. So these are days, so after 365, and we have some missing values. So roughly uh, after 365, uh, uh, one year is over. Um, what do we see? Well, uh, a lot of nitric oxide in these uh, heavy, heavily industrial uh, locations. Um, this is a coal power plant, I believe, in South Africa. And then you have the usual suspects. Yeah? So the uh, big lake, Great Lakes area, um, here that's uh, west of Beijing, uh, and then here in Belgium and Ruhrpott and so on. Um, so we see uh, 
this uh, nitric oxide output of the individual uh, places. But then there's also uh, a seasonal change. So this uh, uh, nitric oxide column measured here and measured up there, uh, they only appear in winter and in summer respectively. And uh, well, it's over the Arctic and over the Antarctic, I think it's actually uh, an artifact of the, uh, of the uh, estimation process. But uh, even so, uh, you know, <coughs> casually we talk about the yearly cycle, and I think this shows up very nicely. So uh, you always see the current uh, time point uh, as the red dot, and these are now the first two principal components. And so each observation can be cast into the space of the first two principal components. And this representation is just a very, very low dimensional summary of your original raw data. And, you know, in this uh, representation, you could uh, identify interesting outliers. So uh, if, if now, for instance, the, the point somewhere made an excursion to here, then by just looking at this plot, you would know that it's probably an, uh, a frame that you want to study in detail to see what happened there. Mean images and eigenvectors. Uh, I'm showing you another example here. Um, this is a paper from uh, Michael Hanselmann, who used to be in this group. So um, in this case, he was looking at mass spectrometric images. And he looked at real data, but also for the sake of this paper, he generated ground truth data himself. So there are um, three components. You see the true mass spectra of these three components and then concentration maps of where they reside in space. So in this case, each pixel in the mass spectrometric image you know, it has a full spectrum. So in this case, each pixel is a single observation, and, or each spectrum is a single observation. And you can then do principal component analysis uh, to estimate what could be the underlying components and where do they reside in space. So uh, this is a summary of what the principal components look like in the old coordinate system. So those are the loadings. And uh, this is how each pixel can be re represented in this new basis. So those images here, they summarize the scores. Well, and you see that for mass spectrometric images, uh, principal components do not make so much sense because you would expect for each mass a count of particles. So these should be entirely positive. And you see that while, while the first component is largely positive, so it points into the first orthant of space, these others here have positive and negative entries. So it's difficult to interpret them in terms of mass spectra. And I'll show you another method that does better on this kind of data. So it is important to, uh, when you do principal component analysis, it's important to be clear about what is an object. In the image, uh, in the example with these uh, digits, each image patch was not considered as a matrix, but as a vector. So each image patch, each digit was considered as a single observation. And the observations have always been arranged into uh, such a matrix uh, with uh, P rows for the features and then N uh, columns for your different samples. Okay, and I will next discuss the singular value decomposition that uh, somehow makes uh, this connection even clearer between what happens in the rows and the columns. Uh, before I do that, um, the column space and null space and row space of a matrix, are these familiar terms to you? So who knows what a row space and a column space and so on is? Okay, so I'll give a short reminder of that. Could you have some light, please?
So the four fundamental subspaces, the first is the column space of a matrix, uh, which is also called the, the image of a transformation or the range space. some matrix transformation given by this matrix with m rows and n columns. And the range of a matrix, as name implies, uh, this is the set of vectors that can be uh, obtained by applying your transformation to an arbitrary vector on the right hand side. So we put in any vector x and then the set of vectors y that we get out that is the range space or the image of matrix A. So from the properties of the uh, matrix multiplication, you can see that uh, this is the set of all possible linear combinations of the column vectors that you can uh, possibly obtain. And that's why it's also called the column space. If there's a column space, there will also be a row space, which is also called the co-image of that matrix. Um, so that is the range of the transposed matrix. And that's a set of all possible linear combinations of the row vectors. And then we have the null space. Also called the kernel of a matrix. And the null space. is a set of all vectors for which a uh, which are mapped to zero when you apply this transformation to them and again by the properties of the matrix multiplication this holds if x is orthogonal to all the row vectors of a So uh, vector x is in the null space of A if it is orthogonal to all the row vectors of A. And this is why one says that uh, the null space is the orthogonal complement of the row space of A. So consider n-dimensional space, we will have a row space of dimension r, where r is the rank of this operator a, and then orthogonal to it, 
we will have some null space with dimension n minus r in Rn. And uh, similarly, in the Rm, we can draw a similar picture with the column space and its orthogonal col complement. So we have a column space with uh, also the dimension of R and then orthogonal to it. There's the left null space or the co-kernel with dimensionality m minus r. And this co-kernel, uh, that's the fourth subspace left null space or the co-kernel just as the co-image this is the null space of the transformed matrix okay these spaces can be used to describe uh, solutions, for example, of uh, algebraic uh, equation systems. So uh, a particular solution uh, exists only uh, if it lies in the, uh, in the range and uh, the general solution is then obtained by the particular solution plus uh, an element from the null space. Okay, and now we can uh, finally talk about the singular value decomposition. So this is one of the let's say, top five techniques in uh, pattern recognition. You will see this again and again. So the nice thing about it is it exists for any matrix. So if we take uh, a matrix A, it lives in an M by N dimensional space. Then the SVD can be written as USV transpose, where U are called the left and V are called the right singular vectors. And S is a diagonal matrix of singular values. And both the left and right singular values are orthogonal. So U transpose U is I and V transpose V. Also is the identity matrix of a different dimension though. And this matrix S is a diagonal matrix with the singular values being ordered. So S1 is larger than or equal than S2 and so on. So every matrix has a singular value decomposition. 
and the singular values are always uniquely determined and if they are distinct, so if you have no degeneracy, then u and v, the singular vectors, are also uniquely determined. It has, uh, this is a subset of the properties that make it interesting for analysis. The rank of a matrix is given by the number of non zero, excuse me, the number of non zero singular values. The Frobenius norm is just the sum of these singular values squared. And if A is a square matrix, then the determinant of A is given by a product of the singular values. The range of A and the null space, they're reflected in these left and right singular vectors. So M by N matrix I can plot this as U So this is M by M, and this matrix here, it's formally also M by N, but this part is not so interesting because it's just zero. And here will be the singular values. And this diagonal matrix. This is S, and then we have V transpose. Where the first part spans the row space. Whereas that part here spans the column space. And down here we have the null space. Now this would be the full SVD. Uh, this is rarely used. Because the, well, because this part is just zero. So if we now omit this part, and if we omit that part down here, we end up with the reduced SVD. And even more, we can now use a low rank approximation using only the first few singular values and vectors. 
So if we now concentrate just on this first part here, So with the orange color, I meant to delete those part of the matrix. Now I'm using a different strategy. I'm shading those parts that are actually kept. So this green part would be a truncated SVD. And this truncated SVD has particularly interesting properties. Namely, it gives uh, the best matrix approximation to the full, it gives the best low rank approximation to the full matrix according to the squared Frobenius norm. So that's a continuation of these interesting properties. And this is the subject of the Eckhart-Young theorem. So let's study the problem of minimizing the squared Frobenius norm of the deviation of a approximation A tilde equal matrix A, where the rank of A tilde should be constrained to be uh, something smaller than the original rank of the full matrix. And so I've, I've claimed that the truncated SVD is the best, but we want to actually show that. I'm using the property that uh, the Frobenius norm is invariant under unitary transformations. So if I take any matrix, if I take the, U the Frobenius norm of a of a matrix U times A, where U is orthogonal. I can rewrite this as the trace of So this holds in general, and I'm using this property now by rewriting the minimization problem in terms of the SVD of A, which we have seen always exists. So And 
I'm now multiplying this uh, from the left with U transpose and from the right with V. So to find overall Now remember that S is a diagonal matrix. So S had these entries, S1, S2, and so on, and is zero everywhere else. And also remember that the Frobenius norm is the sum of all matrix elements squared. So if we now look at this expression, if we have something other than zero here on the right-hand side, this will increase our Frobenius norm. So to minimize this entire thing, the right-hand side should also be diagonal. Because if it's not diagonal, all these non-off-diagonal entries will contribute to our Frobenius norm. So I can uh, write down the USV of A tilde. I could write this is corresponds to the minimization problem of S minus UT. And now I write U tilde, S tilde, V tilde transposed. This is the SVD of A. And well, to make this right hand side diagonal, uh, this will happen only if uh, these two cancel out and if those two cancel out. So we can conclude that U tilde should be the same as U and V tilde should be the same as V. So the singular vectors, both right and left, of this matrix that we are looking for are the right and left singular vectors of our original matrix. We then obtain the following problem. So both matrices are diagonal. So in other words, this is the same as minimizing We're now minimizing over S tilde uh, such that the rank from S tilde is only R. The singular values of S were uh, sorted. And you've seen that uh, typically you know, they look something like that. And we are now allowed to have only R entries in this new matrix S tilde because it has this limited rank. And if I now want to minimize this, uh, the best solution is to copy the largest singular values. So for example, if the rank is restricted to three, and I should take the first three and discard the others. Okay, so the best solution or the 
the best approximation, A tilde to an original matrix A is given by U as tilde V transpose, where U and V are the original eigenvectors of A. So A was U as V transpose. And uh, where S tilde holds only the R largest singular values of S. Okay. So perhaps you already intuitively see uh, how this relates to PCA. Because in PCA, we were looking for the best subspace, but we were looking at uh, the, the spread of the data. So we were in PCA we were looking at xx transpose and we're looking for the best basis to approximate uh, this entity. And now we are looking at, if we do the SVD, we're only looking at uh, the matrix X. And uh, all these problems are equivalent. So using a truncated SVD, will allow to give us the best low rank approximation to our original observations. I will give more details on that after the break, but first I would like to know if you have questions so far. Yeah, I, I ju it's sufficient to just set these singular values here to zero those beyond R and the rest uh, will disappear. So the matrix S is diagonal. And I'm only keeping the first few, only the largest singular values. And associated with these are, well, the first left singular vectors and the first right singular vectors. Um, so the question was, how do we find U and V? Uh, there is a numerical technique which finds them uh, uh, directly. However, uh, conceptually, I think it's easiest to think of that. So X, X transpose, I can rewrite it as U as V transpose, V as U transpose, which is U S squared U transpose. So in other words, I can find the left singular vectors by diagonalizing this quantity. So diagonalizing this, you would perhaps usually write it as uh, D lambda D transpose. Uh, and you can now identify that you know, those are the same. Um, and then once you have found the U's, you can find the V's by again saying X is U as V transpose. So once we have the U's, we uh, multiply U transpose X to find S times V. And S we also know because S is, so by this equation here, S is uh, the, 
let me write in quotation marks, the square root of lambda. This is a diagonal matrix, so I just take the square root of all the diagonal elements of this. Um, and hence I can, uh, you know, I know what this is, so I can write it's s to the minus one times u transpose x. So this will give me v. And this is trivial to invert because it's a diagonal matrix. So that is not how it's implemented in, uh, let's say, MATLAB. But this is how uh, conceptually uh, you can think of it. More questions? Okay. Um, in the native <coughs> SVD implementation, it, uh, by the way, it matters. So in, in most uh, higher level programming languages, you just write SVD of X as a function call, but not all these programming languages are make a clever check. So it could be that the SVD of X takes much, much, much longer than the SVD of X transpose. And you know the results are the same uh, up to transposal. Uh, um, so uh, if you if you work on big problems, it makes sense to for you to, to check uh, which of these, uh, you know, to check if your programming language uh, is smart enough to flip this uh, or uh, if you have to do it by hand. Okay, let's have a break. And then a few more uh, comments on properties of uh, the SVD. And then we're, we'll finally look at probabilistic formulations of PCA.